respiratory distress in newborns. Respiratory distress usually presents as tachypnea, or a respiratory rate greater than 60 breaths per minute. Nasal flaring, grunting, which is a prolonged expiration against a closed glottis, chest retraction, either suprasternal, intercostal, or subcostal, and cyanosis if hypoxia is severe. So first, transient tachypnea of the newborn is by far the most common cause of respiratory distress in term infants. It's a parenchymal lung disorder characterized by pulmonary edema resulting from delayed resorption and clearance of fetal alveolar fluid. Characteristically, the onset is at birth or within the first two hours of life, and it lasts for 12 to 24 hours, but signs may persist as long as 72 hours in severe cases. The diagnosis is clinical. A chest radiograph that detects increased lung volumes with flat diaphragms, mild cardiomegaly, and prominent vascular markings in a sunburst pattern originating at the hilum supports diagnosis. Arterial blood gas measurements typically reveal mild to moderate hypoxemia and mild hypercapnia, resulting in respiratory acidosis. Complete blood count and differential are normal. Now, because it's a benign, self-limited condition, management is supportive. This consists mostly of supplemental oxygen administration by hood or nasal cannula to maintain oxygen saturation above 90%. Severe cases might require fluid restriction. Second, respiratory distress syndrome is caused by a deficiency of surfactant, the phospholipid mixture that reduces alveolar surface tension to keep the alveoli inflated and maintains alveolar stability. So a deficiency in surfactant prevents the infant from generating the increased inspiratory pressure needed to inflate alveolar units, resulting in the development of progressive and diffuse atelectasis. Diagnosis is based on the clinical picture of a preterm infant with the onset of progressive respiratory failure shortly after birth, in conjunction with a characteristic chest radiograph. Chest radiography usually shows low lung volume and the classic diffuse reticulogranular ground glass appearance with air bronchograms resulting from alveolar atelectasis contrasting with aerated airways. Arterial blood gases usually show hypoxemia and hypercapnia. Respiratory distress syndrome also needs to be differentiated from transient tachypnea of the newborn. Now, respiratory distress syndrome is seen more often in preterm infants, unlike transient tachypnea of the newborn, which is usually seen in more mature infants. They also tend to have more severe respiratory distress that doesn't improve quickly, unlike those with transient tachypnea of the newborn. Regarding treatment, antenatal corticosteroid therapy should be administered to all pregnant individuals at 23 to 34 weeks of gestation who are at an increased risk of preterm delivery to prevent or decrease the severity of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. In newborns without respiratory failure, nasal continuous positive airway pressure is the preferred initial intervention. If this fails and apnea develops, the infant requires endotracheal intubation in intratracheal surfactant therapy with paractin alpha, calfactin, or baractin. Now, part four starts one minute after birth or after resuscitation has ended. It's when the APGAR score is calculated at one and five minutes after birth. It's performed to determine quickly whether or not a newborn needs immediate medical care or not, and not to guide resuscitation although it might be a useful measure of the newborn's overall status and response to resuscitation. The APGAR score is composed of five parameters, and each parameter is assigned a value of zero, one, or two for a total of 10 possible points. Okay, so A is for appearance or the skin color of the newborn. If the skin is entirely blue or pale, the score is zero. If it's blue only at extremities, but the rest of the body is pink, the score is one and if no sign of cyanosis is present, the score is two. P is for pulse or heart rate. If there's no heartbeat, the score is zero. If the heart rate is less than 100 beats per minute, the score is one. And if it's greater than 100 beats per minute, the score is two. G is for grimace, meaning the baby is pinched to see if there's any reaction. If there's no response to stimulation, the score is zero. If there's a grimace on suction or aggressive stimulation, it's a one and if the newborn cries on stimulation, two points are awarded. 
The other A stands for activity, meaning the baby's muscle tone must be assessed. If there's no movement, the score is zero. If there's minimal flexion of the arms and legs, one point is given. And if the flexed arms and legs resist extension, the score is two. Finally, R is for respiration. So if the newborn is not breathing, the score is zero. If breathing is weak or irregular, one point is awarded. And if breathing is normal, two points are given. Scores seven and above are generally considered normal, four to six are fairly low, and three and below are generally regarded as critically low. If the score is less than seven at five minutes, it can be repeated at five minute intervals through approximately 20 minutes or until the score is more than seven. If it remains low, further investigation is necessary. If the one minute APGAR score is normal or if it increases with further reassessments, the infant should be given to the mother and placed skin to skin to promote infant maternal bonding and start breastfeeding. The infant can then be admitted to the newborn nursery or neonatal level of care one. Those with a gestational age under 35 weeks require higher levels of care, usually neonatal level of care two or three. And finally, part five is when a brief physical examination is performed to check for any signs of disease. This can begin in the delivery room, but a more detailed examination, the routine examination of the newborn, will be performed later in the nursery room, but within 24 hours after birth. The examination should be conducted in a systematic manner, and although the exact order is not important, it should start with observing the infant's general appearance and body measurements, followed by auscultation of the lungs and heart while the infant is lying quietly, and by a head-to-toe examination. First, the infant's general appearance is assessed for any signs of respiratory distress, cyanosis, or signs of congenital disease like cleft lip, among many others. The basic measurements include measurements of the length, weight, and head circumference of the newborn, which are plotted on standard growth curves to determine the percentile according to its gestational age, and to assess intrauterine growth. Vital signs should be recorded every 30 to 60 minutes during the first four to six hours of life, and then every eight to 12 hours subsequently. Next, the heart sounds are checked to exclude dextrocardia and any possible congenital heart defects. Now, a patent ductus arteriosus might cause a murmur in the first 24 hours, so daily heart examinations are needed to confirm the disappearance of this murmur, usually within three days. The heart rhythm should be regular and the heart rate above 100 beats per minute. The femoral pulses are checked and compared with brachial pulses. A weak or delayed femoral pulse suggests aortic coarctation or other left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The respiratory system is evaluated by counting respirations over a full minute because breathing in neonates is irregular. The normal rate is 40 to 60 breaths per minute. The chest wall should be examined for symmetry and lung sound should be equal throughout. Next, the full body exam begins with the head, which is checked to see if there are any bruises or swelling post-delivery. The fontanelles are measured to detect any possible issue like a large anterior fontanelle, which is a sign of hypothyroidism. The infant's head size and shape are inspected as well to detect congenital hydrocephalus. Then the eye should be examined for the red reflex. Its absence may indicate glaucoma, cataracts, or retinoblastoma. Examination of the eyes might also detect subconjunctival hemorrhages, which are common post-delivery. Next, the chest is inspected for size, symmetry, and structure. A small or misshaped thorax may result from pulmonary hypoplasia or neuromuscular disorders. Chest asymmetry is usually the result of absent pectoralis muscle or from a mass or abscess. Additionally, pectus excavatum or funnel chest and pectus carinatum, or pigeon breast, could occur as an isolated finding. Now, the abdomen should be round and symmetric. Distension is abnormal and may indicate conditions like intestinal obstruction, organomegaly, or ascites. The abdomen may be scaphoid or boat-shaped in the presence of a diaphragmatic hernia. The umbilical cord should be inspected for general appearance, amounts of Wharton jelly, and the umbilical vessels. Next, regarding genitalia, in males, the penis should be examined for hypospadias or epispadias, 
both urinary anomalies, and the scrotum is checked to see if the testicles have dropped. Scrotal swelling may signify hydrocele, inguinal hernia, or more rarely, testicular torsion. In term females, the labia should be prominent. Mucoid vaginal and serosanguineous secretions are normal. Ambiguous genitals are rare, but they may indicate pathologies such as congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Klinefelter syndrome, or Turner syndrome. The anus is inspected for its location and patency. An imperforate anus is not always immediately apparent and can't be assumed patent until the newborn has passed meconium, usually by 48 hours of age. Next, the extremities are examined for deformities, incomplete or missing limbs, contractures, or bone fractures that might have developed during delivery. Screening for hip dysplasia with the Barlow and Ortolani maneuvers is also required, and the spine is inspected for signs of spina bifida. Finally, the newborn neurologic examination includes an assessment of the infant's level of alertness, spontaneous motor activity, tone, muscle strength, and primitive reflex responses. In addition to the assessment of the newborn, there are a few routine procedures needed to prevent some serious issues. First, prophylactic eye care with erythromycin ointment is needed to prevent neonatal gonococcal ophthalmalia. Second, IM administration of vitamin K1 into the anterolateral aspect of the mid-thigh is required to prevent vitamin K deficiency-related bleeding. And finally, Vaccination against hepatitis B virus is recommended regardless of maternal hepatitis B virus surface antigen status. In some cases, the baby can be provided umbilical cord care to prevent infection and monitoring for hyperbilirubinemia and hypoglycemia. Alright, as a quick recap. Part 1 includes what happens before delivery. The basics need to be covered and the maternal and fetal risk factors need to be assessed to anticipate those who might need resuscitation. Part two consists of the first 30 seconds of life. Once the baby is delivered, the time of birth is noted. Next, the baby is dried, kept warm, and its airway is cleared if necessary. If breathing doesn't begin spontaneously, further stimulation might be needed by briefly slapping or flicking the soles of the feet and rubbing the infant's back. Next, Part three takes place within one minute after birth and includes a quick delivery room assessment consisting of three questions. If the answer is no to any of those questions, further evaluation is needed. If the infant is apneic or gasping and has a heart rate under 100 beats per minute, positive pressure ventilation by mask and pulse oximetry monitoring are started. If after 15 seconds, the heart rate is not increasing and stays below 100, ventilation needs to be corrected. Alternatively, if the heart rate is increasing after 15 seconds, positive pressure ventilation is continued and the heart rate is reassessed after 15 seconds. If after 15 seconds it's increased to 100 beats per minute or more and spontaneous effective respiration has begun, positive pressure ventilation is discontinued. If the heart rate remains under 100 beats per minute, take ventilation corrective steps. And if the heart rate is under 60 beats per minute after taking ventilation corrective steps, intubate the infant, initiate chest compression, and reassess ventilation. If the heart rate remains under 60 beats per minute, administer intravenous epinephrine. If the heart rate is persistently under 60 beats per minute, epinephrine may be repeated every 3 to 5 minutes. If there is no heartbeat or respiratory effort for more than 10 minutes, resuscitation efforts may be discontinued. Alternatively, if upon further assessment, individuals present labored breathing or persistent cyanosis and a heart rate above 100 beats per minute, check the airway position, monitor oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry, and provide supplemental oxygen. The most common cause of respiratory distress in newborns is transient tachypnea of the newborn. The diagnosis is clinical. The onset is at birth or within the first two hours of life, and it lasts for 12 to 24 hours chest radiography can support the diagnosis. Management is supportive, consisting mostly of supplemental oxygen administration. Second, respiratory distress syndrome is diagnosed based on the clinical picture of a preterm infant with the onset of progressive respiratory failure shortly after birth, in conjunction with a characteristic chest radiograph. 
Regarding treatment, nasal continuous positive airway pressure is the preferred initial intervention. If this fails and apnea develops, the infant requires endotracheal intubation and intratracheal surfactant therapy. Part 4 starts one minute after birth and after resuscitation has ended. It's when the APGAR score is calculated at 1 and 5 minutes after birth. And finally, Part 5 is when a brief physical examination is performed to check for any signs of disease. It should start with observing the infant's general appearance and body measurements, followed by auscultation of the lungs and heart while the infant is lying quietly, and by a head-to-toe examination. Additionally, the infant also might need prophylactic eye care with erythromycin, vitamin K1 to prevent vitamin K deficiency-related bleeding, and vaccination for hepatitis B virus, 